So, uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about two different kinds of, um, uh, of evolution, two different modes. We call it uh, optimization and expansion. And I've done this work with uh, Paul Sabino, who was uh, uh, one of my colleagues back at the University of uh, Southern Denmark. plan is to um, first go through what I mean with optimization and uh, expansion, then look at some systems that have uh, that show uh, evolutionary optimization. We we'll talk about some physical systems, some biological systems. See how they scale, and then I'll define or I'll go in and show examples of uh, evolutionary expansion. And I will um, uh, I'll focus on on uh, human uh, cultural and technological evolution. I'll go out and and uh, process some of this big data we have out there. So, and. Um, uh, and evolutionary optimization is a process that operates on a set of entities that does not change over time. Where you can consider both the kind uh, of entities and their interactions to be constant. So as long as you have a, a, such a system, you can only have uh, optimization. Now, if you expand on the number of uh, entities and their, uh, their in interactions, it means that you have qualitatively different types and qualitatively different interactions, then you actually expand the uh, configuration space and then you'll have what, is called, what, what we call evolutionary expansion. It's not that, uh, that deep. Um, and then I'll say that uh, many systems, they actually have both, uh, they can both be optimizing and have uh, expansion uh, dynamics in them. But let's start with the simple ones. So, uh, spin classes, uh, many of you I'm sure are aware of that, in particular if you're a physicist, but else these are very simple models that are used to, uh, to model material properties, for instance, uh, uh, ferromagnetic materials. So if you have had a little magnet to play with as a kid, then um, this is a model to, to tell you uh, why these systems, they work in this particular way. And, and they're really, really simple. Uh, you, you take a, a lattice and and on, on this lattice, you, uh, you assign a little magnet, <coughs> and it's a little mesoscopic area in, in your material. And, um, and this little magnet, uh, or this, the, this orientation of, the magnet, uh, of, of magnetization in this area depends on the magnetization uh, direction in the other, in the, in the neighboring area. And uh, what happens is that um, if you um, uh, let such a system uh, go by itself, uh, under the right conditions, then eventually all these magnetization areas, they will uh, sort of point in the, in, in, in the same direction, you'll have a little uh, magnet. And uh, the mathematics to, to do that is, is shown over here. I don't know whether we have a, uh, is there a laser thingy? This one. Yeah, so, so it's, it's given here. Now, now what's, what's really uh, clear for, to, I think for everybody is that the energy of such a system, if you look at the free energy of such a system, uh, will go down. You'll have a, a decay down to a, a ground state where everybody's pointing in the in the same direction when, when, when you don't have any frustration in, in the system. Um, if you then um, make a, a simple calculations, you can uh, uh, you can uh, you can write this uh, into this form here, and you can expand the uh, exponential function. You get the, this form where uh, a um, a mark is the same as k. And you can put it onto the same, um, uh, put it onto the logarithm sign. Then you get a, a, an expression that looks like that. And in particular, this expression is really interesting uh, because we're going to see how uh, we can uh, how we can see the evolution of of, uh, of the system expressed in, in this particular way. And here's an example of a. Um, of a spin glass that uh, we, we I, I can't, if you look at a, at a real material, you can't really see what's happening inside of it, so this is a simulation, but it's one of these fantastic, uh, simple systems in, in, in terms of being able of, of modeling that you actually can, uh, uh, that the simulation, they fit perfectly, almost perfectly to the real system. The good thing about the simulation is that you can actually see what's happening. What, you, what we have uh, depicted here is um, on the um, oh, I'm killing myself here with the laser. <laughs> uh, on the x-axis here, um, we have uh, 
we have um, uh, put, uh, instead of t, we have the logarithm of kt, as we found uh, in, in, in the previous, on the previous slide here. Um, and then we have depicted all the different changes, whenever there is a major change between all these little spins, that actually affects um, the energy in a significant way. So these are the number of quakes, we call it a quake whenever uh, this material ages or whenever it goes towards equilibrium. And this is the number of quakes. And you can see that if you plot that not as a function of time, but as a function of the logarithm of time, you get a beautiful uh, straight line. And this is because um, this system has, we can then interpret um, this I of, I of t as an, as an interaction function, which specifies it has to do with uh, the number of entities and the number of interactions uh, that you have in the system. So um, this is a well-established fact. I mean, physicists have known that for many years, uh, but um, Paulo had this idea that this might also be the case for uh, biological systems. So then we looked at uh, the beautiful um, uh, experiments that um, Linsky and uh, Scavisano they did back in the, in the 90s, where they took uh, uh, an E. coli um, uh, monoculture and then they changed, instead of giving it sugar, I, I don't know what they gave, gave it, potatoes or something, but they, they changed the food source a little bit and then they looked at how, uh, and then of course the, the, the coli was really unhappy and it took a while for it to recover its fitness. So this is a number of generations. Just think about it. They've studied, of course some of you are well aware of that, they studied E. coli for 10,000 generations and they looked at their fitness. They would have both looked at, at biomass and also the size of these uh, little guys. And these are, um, I think these are tw uh, 12 different um, uh, runs with many uh, with, uh, uh, colonies, and this is all of them. And you can see that this looks like many of, of our simulations but, uh, that we have in the ALIB community, but this is actually, these are actually the, uh, the, 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 the results. Now, we uh, put these results, instead of showing them as a function of time, we now look at them as a function of, of, these intera of this interaction function. And this is where you remember, it is the logarithm of the interaction function, and since the interaction function was given by k, k times t, uh, uh, we, can, we can just, put, we can just take the, the logarithm here, and I know it's not very many data, but certainly uh, these data, they don't contradict that they align on a, a straight line. And, uh, and and we can the way we interpret. Remember before we had the quakes. These are the uh, these are the changes in the uh, in the spin class that results in in, uh, in measurable changes in the in the free energy. Here are the quakes, are of course, the mutations that actually have a, a impact on the uh, on the fitness function. So. This means that uh, we have to interpret it. So now we get the same universality class of dynamics between, if you, if you compare on the one hand the, uh, the, the simple physical system, the spin class, and the, the simple uh, uh, biological system, the monoculture of the E. coli. So they, they con they, in this context, they have exactly the same uh, universality uh, dynamics. And, and that means that we have to interpret that the interactions, both the components and the interaction, the quality of the components and the interactions in the E. coli, they do not change over time, at least not uh, at, at this high level that we are measuring. And uh, just to rehash it, I mean, the, the main idea, uh, there the are two main ideas in, 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 a, in, in this paper here. Uh, the first main idea is that uh, once you get this, uh, once you observe that we have uh, the fitness function or uh, the quake function uh, that can be, be expressed in this way uh, in dimensional uh, less uh, parameters, and then we should have this idea of expressing, um, uh, instead of expressing things as a function of time, as a function of the logarithm to time. And then by interpreting this as an interaction function, and this is the slope of the, uh, we saw the slope here before. We can measure the development and measure the slope. Um, then we have a full characterization of, of this system here. And 
And this is the interaction function. We, th this way of looking, this ansatz, using this ansatz, if we then differentiate the interaction function with time, uh, we get that this is a constant. And it means, again, that there is no interactions between, uh, that there's no change in quality changes in, in, the inter in the interactions or in their interaction types over time. Another thing that we should note is that alpha is unfortunately, or I don't know whether it's unfortunately, but it's not uh, universal. Uh, it changes depending on the size of the system. Just think about a, a, a magnetic system, a ferromagnet. The larger the system is, the longer time it will take to, for it to find its, its, its minimum. Uh, and also it changes, the value changes from one, uh, from one system to another. So, so the alpha for the uh, ferromagnetic system is of course different from the uh, from the alpha in, in um, uh, for, for the monoculture of E. coli. Okay, this is evolutionary optimization. Now we go to another system where we have um, an evolutionary expansion. So we look at the human <clears throat> technological and cultural evolution. This is an amazing data set that uh, Oxford University ha has made. Uh, it's an open uh, source set. And uh, they have compiled all kinds of fantastic data. This is one of the really fascinating ones where you have uh, the years out here, and this is a, a GDP, a gross domestic product per capita, in, uh, this is for, for, for England, uh, and I have no idea how they were able to calculate that. <laughs> but this is a beautiful um, uh, data set. You can see here the, the Black Death uh, that we have uh, sweeping through Europe as, as almost half of the uh, British population died. But then, of course, the average fitness jumped up because the people who uh, survived, they, had, uh, they, they inherited the land and the chairs and the tables and what they had uh, from the ones that, uh, that, that died. Um, and we can see through the Middle Ages that there's almost nothing. The church makes sure that uh, we don't get wiser. And then in, um, uh, during the, uh, there's an expansion when, when we go to the colonies and and then at some point uh, the Industrial Revolution takes on. So you have to note that this is a, a logarithmic scale. So I want to figure out what the expansion, I want to measure what the evolutionary expansion is here. And now, before I can do that, I have to make an assumption. I assume that uh, we can use uh, the gross uh, domestic product <clears throat> as a proxy for the human fitness. Um, and uh, this is, of course, uh, an approximation, but I don't think it's t uh, totally uh, crazy uh, because uh, the growth of <clears throat> GDP is, is uh, uh, certainly that's what the economists and people who work in this area, they believe this is a, a very strongly dependent on uh, what we, uh, both our physical in innovations, I mean, hammer and nail and wheel and uh, uh, steam engine and internet and iPhones and whatnot, uh, these are our physical technologies, but also our social technologies, uh, our governance, democracy, uh, women's voting right, rights, whatever. I mean, there is uh, our, our, our religion and our uh, social norms, etc. So as these innovations they take in, um, which we um, believe are the ones that, uh, that changes in a fundamental way how we interact with each other. Now I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, so here it is. So, as we, <clears throat> as we invent new things, as we invent new physical technologies and new social technologies, then the way we interact with each other and the way we interact with the technology and the way the, the technology today actually interacts with the technology changes dramatically. So that means that in this system we will expect, we can also see for the curve, that I of t, this interaction function, will be expanding dramatically over time. So uh, just to give an example of how this INT uh, uh, expands, is if you look at uh, the last couple of decades, uh, so a couple of centuries when, when from the onset of the Industrial Revolution, the communication, we've introduced the telegraph, the telephone, the TV, the internet. These are means of communication that's radically changed the way we interact with each other via communication. Transportation includes the introduction of the railroad, the automobile, and the airplane, which has dramatically changed the way we interact with each other without the airplane. And I guess we are living without the internet here, at least some of us. <laughs> so that, that, that means that, that we wouldn't have been able to be here. So, so the world is, very, is really different. 
and governance uh, includes uh, democracy and, and women's uh, right to vote, etc. So, so that's how I interpret um, this interaction function. Now we come to something that uh, Paolo and I we spent a lot of time on. The, the first part of it, we, we came out, we came back after uh, Christmas break, and we had both had a great Christmas uh, break. So we said, let's do something fun, and then we cooked up and we wanted to look at this problem here. Now, um, we spent the first uh, a few weeks to figure out what we wanted to do and figure the first part of it out, and the, on, on, until actually a little after the deadline of the submission of this paper. Uh, Tim was so nice that he allowed me to wait a little longer. Uh, we had meetings at least every, every week where we spent a couple of hours where we confused each other. So if you guys are confused about this, uh, I, I'm, um, I'm not surprised. Because this next idea uh, of the paper is, at least for us, uh, was not so easy to, to grasp. So now we assume that we have both uh, optimization and expansion in this human system. So to quantify the difference between a baseline evolutionary opti optimization and ev evolutionary expansion for, for gross domestic product, we can derive an expression from IFT, this is what we need to derive, by using the same ansatz and in, as in equation one and the trending the time series. So what we have to do, we have to put our system on the same form as this. So instead of having um, our fitness as a function of time, because we know, we know, learned that from the physical systems and from the simple biological system, that that's the wrong way to look at it. No. We have to look at it as a function of i of t. So we have to have in the x-axis, we have to have i of t. But we don't know what i of t is. But we can actually empirically determine that. And this is what we'll do. So this is um, <clears throat> with the, the real time on the x-axis here. And this is uh, with uh, the logarithm of the GDP. And um, it turns out that you can uh, approximate uh, the, uh, you, can, you can remove the trend by first taking the logarithm, which we've done here, and then uh, impose a, or subtract a third order uh, polynomial. If you go higher up in the polynomial, uh, you actually get only very, very slight uh, improvements. So what we, can, we can ex what we can see here is that the GDP can be ex expressed by an exponential function, which is expressed already here on the x-axis because it's logarithmic. And then uh, instead of just being a function of t, it's actually a polynomial. And then by forcing, um, <clears throat> forcing this uh, structure or this uh, expression into uh, the same frameworks, then, then we know that we want to have this GDP into this framework here which we know is the same as that, it's not difficult to see that we have to identify i of t as e to the 1 over alpha to the e to the pt. So we have a double exponential to express how the number of uh, interactions and quality of interactions change over time. <clears throat> Here we then have uh, this, this uh, data uh, expressed um, not as a function of time, but as a function of inter interaction function, function using the ansatz we, uh, uh, we, had, uh, we, we, we introduced in the beginning. And it looks like this. We identify this function. It looks like this here. It's proportional. Actually, I should have put in 1 over alpha because else you don't have, well, I guess pro pro proportionality maybe uh, is, is still OK. So, so, um, so this is not the, the time axis. This is the logarithm of the e to the e to the p of t. So, and, and again, there is a one parameter that we cannot determine from the data without having a microscopic theory. So here we have put in alpha, uh, equal, the, the line alpha equal, uh, equal to 1 to, um, uh, to, 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 to be able to plot the data. But so far, the theory ha has one undetermined parameter, which of course is really uh, unpleasant. And as I said, we spent... Um, we spent six months uh, confusing ourselves about this. But in the end... Is that one GDP on the y-axis or GDP? No, this is, uh, this is GDP. Uh, so, so here... It's like a log scale. 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. Of course, it's it's a logarithm, but yeah. But we have we have uh, we have then uh, we have then uh, normalized it, which we also did with uh, with uh, with uh, what's it called with the um, with the fitness function uh, for the uh, for the E. coli, where we take the original fitness is equal to uh, whatever it is, and then we divide the fitness with that. So we get we start with <coughs> number one. Uh, we, we start with one and then it grows. So, so this is GDP divided by GDP at, uh, at time zero, which is in the 1270 when, um, uh, when, this, uh, when, when we have these numbers. Great. Okay. So do we have a microscopic theory? And that was why I asked you about this question here. Um, so I've been plowing through some of the uh, some of the literature on on, uh, on patents, and one of the things, <clears throat> one of the first things I well actually I knew that before, but but one of the things that, that that's I think is really fascinating. If you look at the patent, uh, if you look at um, uh, at the years here, and then you look at applications uh, of patents, then you can see that this is an exp this is also a logarithmic scale. So there's a really steep line here, and then it flattens out. So the number of patents is still exponential, but the rate is uh, dramatically lower than the rate was uh, up, up uh, the rate in the uh, in the 1800s and the beginning of uh, 1900. Now, these these are this is this is how uh, this, these are the number of patents. If you then look at uh, the number of categories, uh, the, the number what is it here? These are patents are the red one, and the number of of codes. Uh, has, has uh, sort of flattened out even more. This is what you talked about. There hasn't been many new codes. But what is interesting is that patents, they are not, uh, they are not just building on, on new uh, technologies. They, it's, it's to a great extent also building on combination of existing technologies. And then suddenly you come into a situation where you have, let's say that there are, uh, there are three different kinds of fundamental technologies. And let's say that you can uh, choose uh, M out of these T, then you have a really, really, really big number. And um, Jung and, and, and some of the guys, uh, Bettencourt from SFI, I guess maybe this was also while she was there, I don't know, was she, is she in, the, uh, in the audience? She was one of the, uh, one of the keynote speakers. She only left, unfortunately. She left? No, oh, that's bad. Because I, I had some questions for her. Anyway, so these are, this is the number of categories here. And this is uh, uh, this is the the em empirical uh, number of, of combinations, and um, uh, it almost explodes here. And here you look at this is uh, an, a, an empirical determination of M uh, over the years, and I think this is the actual, and this is the theoretical. Um, so. I guess the take-home message is that um, even though we have slowed down in inventing new fundamentally, uh, fundamentally new things, there are many more things out there to do uh, combinatorics with. But whether the combinatorics actually makes this make sense, whether we have a double exponential, I don't know. So that would be one of the things that I would ask you guys for uh, to help with. But and of course we can have evolution, uh, what was it called, um, um, uh, evolutionary expansion in, in, in other systems as well. And I'll just mention a few of them that we've worked on for many years. Um, back in the beginning of I think it was 2001, um, we came up with a uh, uh, with, with this notion. Maybe we're not the first ones, but we uh, talked about dynamical hierarchies and how you uh, with dynamical hierarchies by adding new stuff to a system. And having these, this new stuff to self-assemble, it was, a, it was a, a chemical system. You could see that these things, for instance, if you add, <coughs> if you add um, uh, uh, lipid molecules uh, and call them the fundamental components, and and have these things to interact in water, then you can get membranes. And once you have membranes, you have an outside and an inside. You have permeability, which are functionalities that do not exist when you look at the, you cannot observe them when you look at the individual uh, polymer. And we've also published how we can uh, actually expand the evolutionary potential from, uh, if you have a protocell that's able to optimize, which all of the protocell models that is out there, at least that I'm aware of, they can only optimize. And there is a, for you to 
do more than optimization, you have to throw more in there so that you expand the uh, space of possibilities. So let's just conclude here. What is it we figured out? Um, I, I was surprised, um, even though Paolo knew that, that actually um, not only physical systems, but simple biological systems, they only optimize. And we can assume that they have uh, qualitatively and maybe even quantitatively no changes in the number of components and interactions. Um, the other thing is that uh, we were actually, what we've been able to do is using this as a base case, we are able to um, quantify what the interaction function is so we can actually measure how much the space of new possibilities expands uh, over time. So what I will say is that open-ended evolution is in a fundamental way associated with processes that at least sporadically have uh, evolutionary expansion periods. But I think that what we should look for is evolutionary expansion, figure out what the mechanism for that is, because then uh, we will have a way to make open-ended evolution. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you very much, Steve. So, I think the polynomial that you use when you detrend those the signals uh, must have carried a lot of information, right? So have you looked at the, what's there in the uh, several different cases? Yeah, so we have, we, we've uh, started, I don't know, we, we, one of my students presented uh, some of this data uh, on the first day, mm -hmm. and uh, we've, uh, we've investigated uh, 28 countries, mm -hmm. and um, uh, all of them have uh, it's a long story, but fundamentally, they all look the same. It's just, if you only look at the Industrial Revolution, it's a second order polynomial, and they have different, uh, they have a little bit different parameters, and the substructure down in this polynomial um, is different, um, but again, you can put it into uh, a number of categories. It's going to take too, lot, too much time, but it's true, there's a lot of information in that. But I think from the perspective of of uh, understanding um, these two different modes of, of, of uh, evolution, that doesn't really matter. But from from, uh, <coughs> from uh, understanding our economy, I think it's really yeah. important. Yeah. And I'm kind of flabbergasted that um, that economists they don't seem to be very interested in the long term uh, trend. They don't, they're not interested in, in history, mm -hmm. at least not the ones that are uh, dominating. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, questions, comments? I have a question. Have you um, have you tried to think about uh, um, how you might take? Well, I think that that uh, trying to ascertain whether or not uh, or or what I of T is um, for an economic system just by looking at uh, GDP data is it seems like it's a uh, uh, pretty heavy lift that complexity from that handful of data points. And um, I'm wondering if you have any um, uh, ideas about how you could actually uh, go to a more typical artificial life model and, uh, and actually compute I of T. If you, you have gen a you mean to generate yeah, if you have an, uh, an, a multi-agent model and you can keep track of everything, including all their interactions, then then maybe it would be possible to, in principle, to actually have enough data to actually compute I of T, and then to see if if uh, your ansatz really plays out. It makes sense. Yeah. No, I, I I certainly appreciate that, and I think that. Before I do that, I think that it will be uh, valuable to go in and look at the physical technologies, actually under, try to go in and look at these uh, patent databases uh, with this eye to, to, to see um, uh, how they grow. And then I think that was um, Adams who said that um, we, should not, we should not just look at, um, at the patents, but also the law, the patent laws, the, all the social technologies. Um, 
I don't know how to quantify those, but I think they are really important for, for how uh, we go about and do things. So we have to we have to find a way to quantify that. I don't know how to do that, but I would love to do that because that would be, uh, I, I don't think it, we will only will throw half of the baby out with the water by only look at the patents. We also have to look at that because patents, you don't patent democracy, you don't patent uh, you know, women's uh, rights or, or the, your religion, but these have tremendous impact, I mean the narratives have tremendous impact on how we think and what we do, our stories, and you remember this morning that uh, Brooks, he was talking about our, um, our uh, what's it called, um, uh, whether we have the right associations and we're thinking about uh, we have the right Jews and whatnot, so, 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 so to quantify that is difficult. But I think I would I would love to to figure this out. Um, yeah, I think even for patented technology, the problem is difficult because the way you were thinking about interaction um, was people interacting in different ways with technology, and so the patents aren't really going to reflect how everybody is interacting with each other on their cell phones. That's right. Um, you might, I think, um, be able to just. Uh, Restrict your attention to the patent data, but even there, there's a there's all kinds of problems with the patent data because like there's no patent for this. There's like a hundred patents for different components of this, uh, but this thing, this piece of tech, important important piece of technology, enabling technology, doesn't have a patent that's just represented in the patent database. That problem um, being said, though, you might be able to use as a proxy for um, interactions from which you could compute an IFT, these, pa these citations. Because the citations are an indication of interaction between technologies. And so that might be a, a place to start just from the patent data. I see a hand up there in the back. Hi there, so um, I remember we we heard a presentation by Joe Tainter a while ago. He was talking about the effects of um, uh, oil and gas combustion engines and the tremendous impact it had on society, GDP being that, the ability of uh, this cheap energy to lift a bunch of people out of property, uh, poverty and therefore increase in GDP. And so one thing that I found was interesting, maybe you could comment on how this new technology, while being much more sophisticated, is not having as much of an impact on GDP in the way it's affecting people's ability, their purchasing power, basically. Yeah, no, there you're absolutely right. And I think that's an indication for why we are entering a new, there's another indication for why we're entering a new era. We simply have to find a better measure. And getting back to the same workshop, uh, Eric uh, Meinhofer and Nick Hanauer, they introduced a different way of measuring uh, how well the economy was doing. And they were using, um, uh, it, they, they said fundamentally GDP um, is, not, is not, we have to dig one step further down. And we have, instead of uh, looking at, at just uh, the value, the market value of the services and the product, we have to look at what is the economy really doing. The economy is uh, making solutions available to people. So access to solution is what we should measure. Access to healthcare access to cell phones, access to clean air, access to not having uh, global uh, climate change. Suddenly, if you define um, economy in that way, you'll get, a, you'll, get a different, you'll get a different calculation and a number of problems that we have today will go away. But of course, who's going to accept that? But anyways, this is, uh, so, 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 because if you, so that, that kind of access to solutions would would uh, include a number of the things that, uh, that 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 you I think you're referring to. And one more thing I want to say is that it's not just we are not just communicating or interacting with each other. We're interacting a lot with the past because through books, papers, and uh, whatnot, there's a lot of things. Wikipedia. That, yeah, Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, that um, so 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 they it's it's so so that they so maybe it's not completely crazy to say or believe that uh, it's, it's uh, super exponential, we have an exponential of exponential in, in these interactions. But again, I, I don't know. Okay, well, I think maybe it's time to give Stina a break and then move to our the last section of our um, 
marathon series of workshops today. Uh,